Hello and welcome to the EDH Retcast, where we're all about commander, data, and dad jokes. My name is Joey Schultz, and I'm joined as always by my fantastic co-host. Up first, he used to play Elish Norn, but she's no longer with us, so now he calls her Elish Morn. It's Matt Morgan. Joey, why do seagulls have to fly over the sea? Uh, why is that? Well, because if they flew over the bay, then they would be bagels, and that just doesn't work. Oh, no, but, you know, but it does make e me hungry. They're, and they're also equally as tasty with everything but the seasoning, too, so. The seasoning. Uh, okay, perfect, 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 perfect. <laughs> All right. Up next, he used the new backup ability to share an ability keyword with me, so now I also have keyword hipster. It's Dana Roach. Of all the inventions in the last hundred years, the Infinite Token is probably the most remarkable. Re remarkable. I see what you did there. That is clever. Also, shout out to Megan from Infinite Tokens. That was aces. I love that, Dana. Thank you. I spent a lot of time on that. I just like eight or ten seconds, I think, looking that joke up. <laughs> 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 really devoted to his craft. We, All right. <laughs> we put in the work here at the EDA track cast. Yes, we do. All right. Well, Dana, what is it that we're talking about in this episode right here? Hopefully you did eight or more than eight or ten seconds of prep for it. I did. Uh, we we're talking about nuisance cards, and in this specific case, cards that we play or, or don't play because they're annoying to play. <laughs> yeah. Not even the ones that are annoying to play against, but the ones where in our own decks when we see them in our hands sometimes we're right, like uh, right just like uh, okay this is like so cards that are a little bit fatiguing they're still good but sometimes the fact that they're a little bit like uh, that they require a little bit of extra patience to play them is sometimes a reason why maybe we don't choose to put them into our deck sometimes this should be a very interesting conversation but we've got some shout outs before we get into it first we'd like to thank chase also known as mana curves for their help in editing the show you can find them on twitter at mana curves Real quick, we also want to shout out Coalesce Apparel and Design, makers of absurdly cool magic-themed merch. Their Keeping It 100 series is legit, I love the Windgrace Forever shirt, and we of course recommend the EDH Rec collection too. And I gotta say, these shirts are comfy. Use code EDH Rec at checkout for any of your Coalesce purchases for 10% off your order. Again, that's code EDH Rec. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by liking and subscribing this video on YouTube, subscribing on your local podcast apps, or by going to patreon.com slash EDH RecCast, where if patron tiers of all sorts of levels, it's a great way to support the show and get yourself a little something in return. And one thing you can get at patreon.com slash EDH RecCast is a weekly patron shout out, which this week we're going to give to Alexis Barca. So Alexis, thank you for barking up that tree and oh, supporting <laughs> us. It was a stretch and i pulled a hammy because of that but alexis <laughs> we do appreciate the support so thank you so much oh, wow yeah big stretch on that one that was oof, that that, that big was a uh, stretch <laughs> but a big stretch is worth it because that's just how much we appreciate our patrons right matt mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. yeah all right cheese exactly. aside let's let's get into our topic dana i'm actually going to pass this off to you because this episode idea was one of yours you have made some posts on the socials of of like, there are cards that are really awesome. I'm sick of playing them. And so I want you to th take off with some cards where you're just like, this card's great. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes I get a little impatient with them. And I'm curious to see what you bring forward. So so the the, the card that inspired this, and it maybe isn't the first example, that, um, but it, it's the one that, that I tweeted about that kind of gave us in pressure for the show, is Cream of the Crop, which I think we did as a challenge of stats once upon a time. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an enchantment from back in Morning Tide. Um, one in the green. Whenever a creature comes into play under your control, even look at the top X cards of your library where X is that creature's power. And if you do, put one of those cards in the top of your library and the rest in the bottom in a random order. So, you know, it lets you basically, based on the creature's power, set up whatever your next draw is going to be. It's a very useful effect. And I put it in a deck I recently built that makes a lot of three power golems. So the, the thought process was I'm, I'm going to be able to churn through and find the cards I need, except for <laughs> the deck makes a lot of three power golems. <laughs> and the, the result was I was hitting situations where like I'd make four or five or six sometimes on a turn and I have to dig down three cards and okay, put one on top. But because they came at the same time, all these triggers are then happening. So then I'll dig down three more and said, okay, that, 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 the one that I kept last time was in a stay. And then I'll dig down three more. And that's, I'm not saying that's not very, very powerful. It is if like, if you're looking to just dig through your library for a specific card, that will do it. 
Or I could have just rent a tutor and went and got a card too, right? And, <laughs> and, and just finished it in like eight seconds versus turning it into this whole process. So it, it's a it's a very, very powerful card and, and it's annoying to have to do and it's time consuming. And <laughs> I actually, after that post, I wound up replacing it in the deck because it was just it, too much fiddling around and it was too much time being consumed for something that I just would rather do other things in my game. Gotcha. Yeah, cream of the crop is a fantastic card, and and we def it, yeah, it's definitely not a case of this card isn't good or powerful or very useful in some decks, but mm -hmm. the 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 time investment it is that is required in a lot of decks maybe doesn't end up being a benefit because it just it takes so long. Like if you're playing one big creature a turn, it's a fantastic way to set up your next few turns. Yes, absolutely wonderful, but. Uh, if you're playing a bunch of tokens like you are, Dana, uh, yeah, I could totally see why you would get frustrated just trying to resolve it just for one turn, much less over the course of a game. <laughs> the the better that card is, the less fun you had with it. Right, exactly. And that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, if you're just dropping like one four four or five five or something, it's it's good and that's you're using it one time and and, and it's less annoying. When, you know, eight three three golems come into play, <laughs> it's amazingly powerful. And amazingly annoying to deal with. So, right. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Joey. The better it gets, the more annoying it is to have on the field when you're playing with it. Yeah. And, and like, again, that's not necessarily the reason not to play it. For you, it is. But, like, this card is good. So, like, people should be encouraged to play it. It's For just sure. like, this is heads up a card that, you, you know, you might need to have, as Matt said, a bit of a time investment into it. And that's worth taking note of for helping to craft the experience that you want. And so... To move on to another example, which I know both of you have talked about on the show before, Matt, can you tell me how you feel about Cathar's Crusade, the five minute enchantment that puts a plus one counter on every creature you control whenever you get a creature into play? Are you a fan? Isn't it awesome? I mean, I love this card, but um, some recent complaints I've heard might indicate that some folks are a little sick of it. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's probably the best card I refuse to play for myself, honestly. <laughs> and that's, that's a tall order because I, I have a lot of decks. Like, if you've listened to the show before, which you may have done, you probably heard me say that I love the combat step, which requires creatures. Creatures love plus one, plus one counters. I don't have it in any one of my decks anymore because the time investment and just the tracking of it. Like, I only have so many D20s in my possession <laughs> and pretty much any deck built to abuse it. I'm going to run out of those D20s so stinking fast. Like, and it's absolutely fantastic card. It, like I said, it's probably one of the most powerful cards that you could be playing in a creature deck, but yeah, I'm just, I'm not, and I'm playing a lot. So, but the, so Cathar's Crusade, for those of you who don't know, three white, white for an enchantment says, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. So if you have five creatures that enter the battlefield all at once, they're all going to trigger, they're all going to get five counters. But then if you have another creature entering and then you have another creature entering, you're trying to track so many different counters on so many different creatures just the again time investment i love the card it's powerful it's a 15 dollar card like it's it's very widely known it's played in over 86,000 decks on EDA trek i just don't like playing it anymore because the the time that takes to properly track it it just slows the game down so much for me the the deck i was playing it in years ago this was was a tesa orzov scion deck and Tesa has one of her abilities is whenever a, a black creature you control is put into a graveyard from play, you put a 1-1 one, one white spirit token with flying into play. And the deck was running a bunch of relatively cheap black creatures that could either come back from the graveyard like a resembling skeleton or just come back to your hand to be recast. Mm -hmm. So the, the plan was to make just a ton of tokens by playing these cheap black creatures that I could recur, sacrifice them to some kind of a sack outlet, which would, you know, make me the spirit and then I could recast them and sacrifice them again to make a spirit. Except for if you have Catherine's Crusade out, which is amazing in that situation, but you sacrifice, you play that black creature and put a counter on all of your things that were already in play and then sacrifice it and make the spirit, which puts a counter on all the things that you already had and then bring the thing back into play again and put counters on all of your stuff again and then sacrifice. Like, and then you're getting different numbers of counters on things depending on what sequence they came into play too. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it was just, just a night. I mean, in if I had it out, I probably killed people because I, I would those creatures would get so buffed so quickly. But it was just a nightmare to deal with to to get all those dice out and start keeping track of all that stuff. That like a card that won me the game if it was allowed to sit and play became a card I didn't want to run because <laughs> it was just so much bookkeeping. 
I feel you on that. I still use this one in my Thalys Reverend Medium deck because that one does tend to make a whole bunch of things all at once. It's just like, mm -hmm. here's a spell that makes just five tokens. And then at the end of turn, Thalys is going to just make, boom, five more tokens. That math, pretty easy. I can do it. But when it is those one-off instances where like, oh, okay, now I need a separate pile. Like these spirits have this many counters on them, but this spirit has a different number of counters on it. And then here's a new one and that. All right, so this token is separate from that other token of the exact same. I can't put them into the same pile of tokens uh, this dice represents how many i have but this dice represents how big they all are but then there's a separate pile that like it does get a little headachey mm -hmm. i still love it it's still crazy powerful and matt as you noted it's showing up in a big number of decks and it absolutely should yes but i get why sometimes sometimes you're just like you know what can i just get an old-fashioned pump effect and just attack instead like right. I, I totally get <laughs> right. it sort of on dictative heliod give my stuff plus two plus two and that'll probably win anyway <laughs> yeah yeah see i i made the mistake of playing monastery mentor in a deck with Cathar cathars crusade oh the prowess. and with each diff with the well with the prowess but also each token entering at a different time which means i had <laughs> i couldn't say i have okay i have five tokens that all have five counters on it. it's like oh no i have one with five i have one with four and just yep. it cluttered <laughs> yeah. so much and like i wanted to win condition i didn't want a math lesson and that's why i took the first crusade out excellent you know what speaking of clutter i want to name two blue cards here that i have moved away from one of them very early in my commander career and one of them a little bit more resentfully in my commander career um when you're talking about clutter telepathy the one mana everyone, all of your opponents play with their hands revealed? No, I'm not dealing with it. Like, I don't, perfect information would be really good for the game. I don't want to deal with that many cards face up on the table. And heaven forbid, if we're playing on spell table, I will just, my, my opponents will, like, kick me from that game. And they would be correct to do so. But the other one that I am a little bit sadder that I don't really use anymore is Clone Legion. Matt, you want to talk about clutter? Uh, what? Nine mana. Oh yeah, for nine mana, for each creature target player controls, create a token that's a copy of that creature. This is a nuisance card for me. This is one where I'm like, this card's amazing, but tracking all of that stuff is just, it, it failed to be worth it for me. Cause I'm just like, oh, it's great. I'll put myself into an amazing game winning position. I am tired of of trying to track which of these things is supposed to be which. Like, and again, shout out to the infinite tokens, which I think is the only reason this card is even playable in the first place. But oh man, this this is one that really fatigues me a lot. Yeah, you're you're not just making like a three three golem and a you know two two bear and a one one goblin or something. You're making like specific creatures with whatever power and toughness they may have, with 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 rule text that might matter, with multiple creature types that might be relevant, with names that are sometimes relevant relevant uh -huh. so like there's a you basically need to like write the whole card down on your infinite token times the dozen creatures that you just copied <laughs> and again fantastically strong card if you get to nine mana and there's a there's a there's a board state out there absolutely so good like i just don't want to do any of this <laughs> to harken back to an episode we had recently just play insurrection that way instead of having to make <laughs> copies of everything just just <laughs> physically take everything win the game there that way it's so much less to track than a clone legion sometimes we're playing an esper deck and we can't use insurrection though Matt. sometimes my yannette wants a nine mana spell off the top but but this one is just a little bit like oh you know what I just wanted to attack and play a flip a nine drop and this one this one has a lot of extra baggage that you know I wasn't ready for that <laughs> Joey I, I just hear a lot of excuses when you just could be playing better colors that's all I'm saying better how <laughs> dare you Matthew all right well I, I I have a question for the two of you quickly yeah okay did you pay the one yeah, oh my <laughs> did did you pay two for that card you just drew. Did you pay? The, did you pay the two? That that's probably more annoying. Is did you pay the two? Because you you don't cast spells every it's, turn. You definitely draw cards every turn, though. Quintessential example. I mean, it's it's easy to complain that like smothering tithe and mystic study are annoying to have someone have on the board against you, but, but they're annoying to play too. Let's be honest. <laughs> ha having to ask everyone if they paid every single turn is annoying. Yeah, it is. And honestly, I like I think those are the most quintessential examples of it. Um, but they're they're certainly not the only ones. There are a lot of cards out there that do have that like, okay, you got to keep track of and constantly remind people and, and, and just like li little things that like if you are not paying very, very careful attention to the game state, you might lose track of the value you're supposed to be getting with these. Like mm. I, I think of uh, the Mangara card, for example, who needs to track how many spells your opponents are playing or how much they're attacking with or uh, 
to an extent, Smuggler Share is also kind of this way. It's like this little memory game. Monologue tax might be another one of those. Matt, I know you love your monologue tax. No, but I don't. Like, yeah. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or even like small examples like Blind Obedience, where it's just like, ah, remember, your stuff comes in tapped. Ah, remember, your stuff comes in tapped. That also can sometimes disrupt the flow of a game. And it kind of just feels a little squicky to remind people about all the time, too. So I'm like, I like these cards. They're, they're, they're fun cards, but I'm just like, eh. <laughs> yeah, in, in one thing I'll kind of note, too, Rift study at least like you can kind of make the note people can be like if i don't say anything assume i don't pay it or, or whatever there, there's there's things like that that happen smuggling tithe has that weird interaction though where like you don't determine if you pay until after you draw the card which is sometimes relevant yeah so it's much it, it's a little bit more tricky to to just like shortcut that one than it would be with rhystic study yeah there's just so many little small i hate to make a blanket statement that says tax like stacks cards they're just unfun they're, they're finicky whatever but there's so many that just kind of slow the game down, not because not with what's happening, but just all the actions that you have to keep interrupting and injecting into the conversation, too. That's that's where I think the distortion comes the most impactful, at least for me. But, but Dana, similarly to, you know, the, the, the Rhystic Studies, the Smothering Tithes, Thalia, her, those types of cards, too, like they're they're very easily that you can play in pretty much any white deck. But then stuff like Defense Grid or any slight tax effect that just kind of slows things down, Thorn of Amethyst. Mm. Those are the cards that really get annoying to me because not only do they tax things, but it's only sometimes kind of. So like right. Defense Grid, for example, <laughs> is an artifact, two mana. Uh, during each player's turn, each other player's spells cost three generic more mana to play. So on your turn, it's fine, but then you have to get taxed on other people's turns. So you're constantly tracking that. So yes, it's a tax card, but only maybe some, sometimes. And those are the types of cards that just, it's so frustrating because if you're not the person playing it, especially, you see it and you have to keep track of, okay, who has the defense grid again? Whose turn do I have to plan around? And you'll see people with cards like that. I know, Dana, you will do this all the time when we play at twitch.tv slash EDH Retcast <laughs> is something, you know, I, I might have something on the battlefield and Joey has his turn before I do. So you'll be casting spells at the end of Joey's turn because of whatever s kind of small tax effect might be lining up on my turn. So it's just little cards like that. They're just annoying to keep track of. And I just, yeah. they slow the game down. That gives people so many things to track on board, which I love on board tricks. But this is just a little too much for me. The thing that I think could actually be most bothersome about these are the moments where you don't catch it. Like you don't realize, oh, shoot, authority of the consoles in right. was in play. I was supposed to gain life. And how much was I supposed to gain? Your stuff was supposed to be tapped. Did we all remember that? Would have that have switched what you would have played if we had all re remembered this? Did you pay the extra two for the aura of silence that we forgot was in play? Stuff like that. Like those little things where they create a board state where you realize, oh, shoot, I have to go back because we all missed that because it interrupted the flow of the game that we were all having a nice social time and again like or of silence that's a great card that card is so dang good yeah but it is one of those where i'm just like i feel like a hall monitor when i play this card and that's not the energy that i really want to be bringing into most of my commander games so i'm just gonna go ahead and remove that one from my rotation yeah blind obedience is definitely one that i where i've had i've, I've done that with for sure because it was a card that it, it was in gate crash i think um, and I did, that was when I first came back to Magic and I just played a lot of Gate Crash. And it was a very cheap card. So I had a lot of copies of Blind Obedience. Mm. And I, you know, I could very easily have just jammed it into every white deck. And, and you probably wouldn't be wrong. It's very, very efficient. It doesn't affect you at all. Um, and it's one of those cards that whenever I put it in decks, a lot of times when you're looking to make a cut for something else, you're like, Thinking back on all the times that you had to roll things back because somebody missed the thing coming in a play tapped and like mm. all the times that like people rolled their eyes when you had to give them a little reminder. Like that's definitely one that I have pulled despite the power level because it's just annoying. It's annoying for me to have it in my own deck. All right. Well, I think, Dana, you pointed out that like Rhystic Study and Smothering Tithe and I, I kind of called those quintessential examples, but I think actually... I think actually this might be like one of the most sparkling, big, like bombastic examples of the the finicky stuff that like even though it's great, sometimes you just don't want to deal with it. I got the party time precon a little bit ago, and uh, that has like Nalia de Arnis uh, as your your rogue in charge of the all of the parties of the clerics and stuff like that. I happen to use the. Um, the Barakos and Folk Hero as the leaders of that one. It's a really fun pre-con. Um, and I've like lightly tuned it, but not a whole lot. It's a really fun deck to get people to learn to play the game with. I think the strategy is really engaging. But there was one card in that pre-con that I was like, you know what I don't want to deal with every single game? 
This seasoned dungeoneer bringing the initiative into every game is a little bit tedious for me, despite the fact that I love the initiative. I really, really enjoy the initiative. One of my family members has an initiative deck, and I just got a custom playmat of the Undercity dungeon done, and it was like really fun. A dedicated initiative initiative deck is so fun to me. But the seasoned dungeoneer bringing just this one-off, you take the initiative card in the deck, I was like, every time I saw it, I was like, I do not want to deal with this. So I did cut it, despite the fact that Seasoned Dungeoneer is so good in a party deck because it gives extra benefits to those creature types. It's so good. And I, I don't think you should cut it from that deck. But for me, I was just like, one-off initiative cards, I'd rather have a whole bunch of it and commit to the bit or I'm not going to deal with it at all because that's a lot of stuff to suddenly keep track of out of nowhere. So initiative also pretty quintessential for this finicky nuisance experience. Yeah, like I... I hundred percent get that thought process where you're like, oh, I don't want to have to bring four copies of this dungeon with me with this deck on the off chance one creature in the deck that needs it comes out and on the off chance that someone else takes the initiative from me and then needs to have their own dungeon too, or then someone takes it from them and like it's it just you're creating a bunch of extra work for yourself um that you may not even need and when you do need you're not gonna like it either. So like it's it, it's frustrating on a on, on multiple levels. And I think particularly in Commander where we have so many options, it becomes easy to just go, that card's good, but I'm just going to pull it for something else that's also good and also isn't annoying. Yeah, I, I've pulled Under Mountain Adventure from a couple decks now because uh, yeah. even when it happens, it, it fits perfectly into my Raga Draga deck because it's a, a big creature that gets even bigger because Raga Draga gives creatures with mana abilities you know, a, a buff. But having to track the initiative, all that stuff... I. I love Monarch. It's probably one of my favorite mechanics for multiplayer formats. Mm. An initiative was so close to being that, but because you needed to have, like we pointed out, separate cards, separate dungeons, all that stuff, it just became such a drag. And I, I took it out because, yeah, it just the fun that it added wasn't what I was hoping it would be. And I, I'm still hopeful that initiative maybe isn't as hard to execute. But, yeah, this is such a, a hard mechanic to to really go light on i guess because yeah if you just casually have it in there there's just so much else that goes into the game that you have to track yeah like and again one of my family members has an initiative deck and honestly that deck slaps it is way better than i would have ever expected like blinking initiative creatures to go through the undercity multiple times it's really good it's way good and better yet it's really fun when you know that that's the experience that you're getting into when you see an initiative commander and you're like oh okay i think i get what the aspect of this game is going to be this will be a consistent presence throughout the game and that changes the way sort of like knowing a queen marchesa is over there in the command zone it's kind of like oh okay that'll be exciting when you sit down to play it but like you yourself bringing all right guys here's the initiative suddenly out of nowhere that one does feel a little bit to me like uh, that's not quite what i thought i was in the mood for and just for me it, again this is just a for me thing i was like a one-off initiative sure i actually took it out of the deck despite the fact that seasoned dungeoneer is so dang good in a party deck i would play that card if it didn't bring the initiative into into, into the game well it, yeah Initiative isn't the only mechanic that kind of feels that way, too. Um, the segue mechanic, where, like, after you do about 20 minutes of wow. the Shrek cast, you move into doing the challenge of stats. What? You. Masterfully done, good sir. I Thank you. I tip my cap to you, as such a gentleman would. I have nothing. I'm just aghast. <laughs> you should have compliments, because it was such a well-done segue, Joey. I think that's why we don't let you do the segues anymore, is because you don't appreciate a good segue when you hear it. No, I. it's help. Okay, let's take a break and come back with Challenge the Stats, I guess. This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. So, I don't know about you, but here's a thing I learned about myself. I might think I know how I'm feeling about stuff, but when I go to try and vocalize it, to communicate it, put it into words, it all comes out in a twisted, jumbled mess. Trying to organize all my abstract thoughts and emotions and then to verbalize it is, frankly, tougher than I thought it would be, and I'm glad for the opportunities to practice that in a judgment-free way with someone who's there to help me figure that whole process out. And that's why we're glad to be sponsored by BetterHelp. Therapy is all 
all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. Because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com EDH today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash E-D-H. All right, so I'm going to open up our challenge stats this week, and it's not very often that we get a chance to say a card that's being played in almost 60% of decks underplayed. But here we are because this is a card that I just think what it does for the value, especially when it's combined with the commander, it's just extremely, extremely hard to beat. So I'm going to talk about Azuri Stalker of Spheres decks, which are the, uh, the the new Simic commander from All Will Be One, where you had all sorts of proliferating effects going on. Whenever you proliferate, you draw a card uh, that has the Enter the Battlefield ability true too. But the card that I'm seeing that is played in almost 60% of decks is Contentious Plan, which is one in a blue for a source that says proliferate, draw a card. So if you look at the rate when you have Azuri out, it's basically two mana, proliferate, draw two cards. And Dana plays a lot of cards that draw you two cards for two mana, but he also pays two life to do it. (laughs) So to have a card like this that's playing into the strategy of the deck, whether you're doing infect and toxic shenanigans, you're doing all all sorts of plus one, plus one counters, whatever you're trying to proliferate, Contentious Plan does that, plus it draws you two cards, which leaves you up. It's just such a fantastic rate for a mere two mana, only 60% of decks. And like I said, it's really hard to say a card played in that many decks is underplayed, but no matter what counters you're proliferating, this card is just great. It's fantastic. It replaces itself, plus one. It's just It should be in pretty much every deck, no matter what you're doing. It's not even like it's an expensive card. It's 50 cents. Just a, a fantastic upgrade in your card draw slot. A contentious plan. If you're playing a Zuri Stalker of Spheres, just play it. Just play it, people. It's so good. In fact, you still want it. Plus one counters. You still want it. Planeswalkers. Still want it. You still want it. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yep. That's a great one. So I guess then I'll go to my challenge here. And this is our listener submitted challenge. It comes to us from Max Barnaby, who emailed us with a very spicy pick in the complete opposite colors of you, Matt. We're going straight into the Mardu deck, specifically Dihada Binder of Wills, which is that Mardu Legends Matter pre- uh, Precon Commander. And it's got a very fun plus two effect that Max Barnaby has honed in on here. Dihada has that plus two loyalty ability that says up to one target legendary creature gains vigilance, lifelink, and indestructible until your next turn. And this is really, really fun with certain cards in that precon, like Audric, for example, who shares all of those keywords. Like, that's really great, right? And that's why Max is like, hey, don't you think a Groose Coast Eternal Soldier from Jumpstart should also be appearing in this deck too? A Groose Coast is a really cool card. Four mana, three, four spirit soldier, vigilance, and it says whenever it becomes the target of an ability that targets only it, you can pay one and a hybrid Boros mana, so two mana. And if you do, you copy that ability for each other creature you control that that ability could target, and each of those copies targets a different one of those creatures. So again, you're getting that Audric sharing abilities effect here because Dihada could you know, use that little loyalty ability up there, give a Gruskos a bunch of awesome, ridiculously powerful keywords, and then a Gruskos can be like, what if the whole team though? And Dihada's ability says until your next turn, which is ridiculous. So you're giving your team Vigilance, Lifelink, and Indestructible until your next turn every time that you use this effect. And it's a legendary creature, which Dihada just loves in general. If you really enjoy Audric in that deck, you're really going to like this in that deck as well. Max notes that a Groose Coast is only showing up in less than 3% of Dihada Binder of Will's decks right now, and it, that it should be showing up in a lot more than just that. And I totally agree, Max, this is a great challenge. Um, my challenge of stats is a card that I have challenged before, but in a general sense, and I want to challenge it for a specific deck this week because it just came up because a friend of mine built a Tatsunari Toad Rider deck. Hmm. Uh, for those who don't recall, Tatsunari Toad Rider um, is a legendary creature human ninja. Whenever you cast an enchantment spell, if you don't control a creature named Kemi, um, create Kemi, a legendary 3-3 black and green frog creature token with whenever you cast an enchantment spell, each opponent loses a life and gains a life. The car- My friend built this deck and, and 
took it for his first test drive and afterwards was happy with it, but was complaining that he didn't have enough card draw. He needs some efficient card draw for this deck to, to help him dig down to find his pieces. I'm like, okay, well, you're running of one mind, right? He's like, what is that card? <laughs> Uh, of one mind, two and a blue, the spell costs two less to cast if you control a human and a non-human and you draw two cards. And right there on Tatsuni Totorider, which is a human that makes a non-human creature. So just by virtue of playing your commander, odds are really, really good that you just have a one mana draw two spell in that deck. And there's 5,000 uh, Tatsunari decks in our database, only 22 of them running of one mind. It's just like... Possibly the most efficient one and done card draw spell you can run in that deck. And it should be in way more than 22 decks. And my friend has already put it in his deck. And it doesn't even cost you life points to draw those two cards, Dana. Right, exactly. And that, that part I don't love, but <laughs> still really, really efficient. Dana is committed to the bit. If it doesn't make him lose life to draw cards, he is not interested yes, for his absolutely. own purposes. So <laughs> I don't, uh, I, I adore you, dude. All right. So before you absolutely just like completely decimated me with your out of nowhere mechanics challenge, you know what the thing I thought you were going to say was? I thought, you were, that? I thought you were going to say that there were other mechanics that also might be a little bit of those nuisance type of things. You know, we mentioned one of them being the initiative, but I fully thought that Matt or you would want to talk about the day man and the night man, uh, <laughs> whatever always sunny reference that you guys always, always like to make because day and night feels like another one of those mechanics that also is a little bit like... Hmm, do I want to introduce this into the game? I don't know, Matt, am I off my rocker here? <laughs> I, I do appreciate your shout out to us both enjoying that show. So that that's that's a good job. Um, you, you know, you're fighting off the Nightman and that's that's great. Fantastic for you. But um, yeah, the, the, the Daybound, Nightbound cards themselves, it's really hard to keep track and, and just you forget, oh, do you need to cast zero spells or cast both of them? You have to be very, very intentional about tracking it mm. in order to to really make sure it's not going out of your way. It's not a dis distraction from the overall experience. Uh, I've I've had one offs of cards. I I've had Tovalar Hunt Tovalar's Huntmaster in a couple decks because it, it does a lot of things that I like to do in my typical deck. Uh, Joey, I know that you also. I mean, it's a Green Grave Titan for crying out loud. You have to like this card a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it's really cool. <laughs> this card is fantastic, but it's just. It's so much work to keep track of along with everything else that's going on in the game. And, and magic gets so complex so quickly that a lot of these cards that we're talking about, the, the, just the, the complexity they add is just so much higher than the typical card. And that's just that's probably why we get so discouraged playing them. And, and here's especially the thing that is, is, is tough about them. Once you have day and night, you do have to track it for the rest of the game because some of these cards like the Tovalar's Huntmaster or Outland Liberator is another one, which can, I think, sacrifice itself to destroy an artifact or enchantment. And like, y'all know me, I used to have a Marin deck, sacrifice a creature to destroy my opponent's stuff. I'm all, I'm way interested in this. But if I play the Outland Liberator, then suddenly I have to start tracking day and night for the rest of the game. And that could matter because even if Outland Liberator is no longer in play, I could revive it in a future turn and I would need to be able to actually accurately accurately represent which side is it supposed to be on when it comes back in play, depending on whether it's day or whether it's night and how the game has evolved from there. And you know what? That's not the work that I want to do for this little uncommon guy. That's just a thing that I was like, I think I've lost interest. I, I think I, that's, you know what? I'll go with a different thing that will get rid of artifacts and enchantments instead, because as cool as that card is, I, if I revive it later, I don't want to be like, oh, wait, is it, what what time is it? Like, I just it, it made me feel a little bit like I'm I'm, I'm just not going to even bother. I'll be all right if I, I can focus on my game better if I'm not using mental bandwidth on that. The one that really jumped out at me here that I thought I was going to play in a bunch of decks was the Celestis. That's mm. the, the three mana mana rock. Um, and when it comes into play, if it's neither day nor night, it becomes day. Um, you can just tap it for mana of any color, and you can spend three, and if it's night, it becomes day. Otherwise, it becomes night. Um, whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, you gain a life, and you may draw a card, and if you do, you discard a card. So my thought process was, oh, it's a three-mana rock. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm running a bunch of two-mana rocks. Why not run a three-mana rock that's just going to accidentally sometimes, even if I never use the ability to turn it day or night, it's just going to... Dare Knight's just going to happen based on the number of spells that get cast, and I will occasionally gain a little bit of life and draw a card and, and, and do some filtering. 
that seems like a pretty good deal mm. for for just passively having some some free card quality selection. The literally the first time I played it, I was annoyed. That, like <laughs> now I've introduced this day night thing to a game that didn't have it, and it served no purpose other than to occasionally generate me value. And I just felt like a jerk for like making the game more complicated for almost no reason. Dang, that's a. Uh... That's rough, buddy. So yeah, that's that. That to me is the like perfect example of the Dare Knight example because it's it's a card that like I just thought I would use a lot, and I have I took it out and never put it back in any other deck since then. Well, I mean, Dana, as long as we're talking about different mechanics and stuff like that, I mean, what do you think about stickers and attractions <laughs> and the complexity that they bring into the game? I, I can't even so, say this so, with a straight face. Oh my god, screw screw so, stickers no, so much. So, so looking at our show notes, and, and we were we assumed this would be just kind of a joke, and we laugh and move on. I tried an attraction card. Um, there, there's an attraction card called the Most Dangerous Gamer, and it is legal in Commander, um, and it has Death Touch. It's in my Golgari color, so I'm like, well, I'll try it in my Glissa deck. It's, it's just free value. Whenever it comes into play or attacks, you open an attraction. The attractions all have some kind of upside to them. I'm like, well, I'll play this thing that has Death Touch. It will generate me free value. I'm, why not try it? And same thing. The one time I played it, I was immediately annoyed. Like all these, I, I, I eventually, I think before it finally died, I think I had four or five attractions out. Hmm. It generated me value, and it was super annoying and made for a cluttered board state, and I promptly took it back out of the deck. It's just not exactly like the day or night situation. Just because it generated me value and was maybe worth running doesn't mean it was worth the like headache and annoyance it generated. Yeah. Yeah, anything from Unfinity, that's just a whole other layer of a nuisance because you have to do your own <laughs> right. homework, not only in what the card does, but if is that card even legal to play in Commander? Like, I recently saw a, a list for a storm deck in legacy that won a big event and had two of the infinity cards in there. And I was like, what, how are those, those aren't, those aren't legal. And so it's just infinity in general. I, not to yuck anybody's yum, but you will never see me putting any infinity cards in a deck because I just don't want to do the homework. And I don't want to put the onus on the people I'm playing with to believe me that I did my homework. Yeah. It's just such a weird thing. And if that's your, if, if you enjoy playing unsets, Cool. Good for you. I'm glad that you have your thing. It is just definitely not for me. And, and it sounds like it's not for either of you two either. Dana, would you say that you feel similarly about mutate? <laughs> Do I dare say these words to him? I, I, just... I think we, I mean, I think I've made my thoughts clear and how, how annoying these <laughs> Said the M word on the podcast, Joey. You're <laughs> yeah. going to go sit in time out now. And, but, but, but I've, I've, per, I've mostly complained about playing against mutate, but there was a situation. There's, there's a pretty decent cat. I don't remember which one it is in Slesnia Colors. Um, that would have been good enough for my son's Arabo deck. And I, again, I was just like, I, I don't want to have to deal with explaining to other people how Mutate works that don't know how it works just for this one card. And maybe it would be different if you had a full Mutate deck and like yeah. you giving the rules out would apply to all the cards in your deck. Maybe that's worth it for you if you like Mutate a lot. Having to deal with it for just one single card just definitely didn't seem like it was worth a headache for me. So I, I did not put that in the deck. So yeah, that's, I mean, I don't love playing against it, but I, I also didn't want to play it either. I, I really like that as a thing of just like the the explaining of the rules can also be another way into the, how some of these cards can be nuisances or headaches or something. I think I brought up mm -hmm. um, Reconnaissance as an example when we were talking about uh, building decks for new players. This was a, a card that I wouldn't want to put into a deck for a new player because the rules with Reconnaissance are weird because there's technically this part after combat where you can have the creature untap even though the, like the reminder text on the card says but then it wouldn't deal any damage but technically the rules are different from when that card was printed and it's just like explain explaining how you can still use this card even after the creatures have dealt damage and like the whole different stages of combat it's it's just like i i don't know that i have the energy for that all of the time i think that's a really great uh thing to go forward and now matt i'm just like are there any cards where you're just like you know what i don't think i want to talk about this card for the next five minutes whenever i cast it like are there any of those for you i mean the not so much when you cast it but when other people cast their spells but perplexing chimera that card Ooh. can, I still don't, there, so I'm going to introduce a whole category of cards that like, I know what they do in principle, but I couldn't tell you what the cards actually say. And Perplexing Chimera is that a peak example of that because it just, it messes up so many things that people are trying to do moving forward once that card resolves. 
Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may exchange control of Perplexing Chimera and that spell, and if you do, you may choose new targets for the spell, so you can steal other people's stuff. And then that's going to be the case for everyone forever, and it does make the stack kind of stop every time anyone considers playing anything. Yeah. Every, every card becomes a negotiation situation instead of just playing a card. Yeah, like, there's so many cards like this. Like, Tybalt's Trickery, I know what the card does in execution but there's so many words on that card that just like it, it just clutters up the what like what you're actually saying to other players as far as what it does mm, that's a really good example wheel of misfortune that's got to be another one right like <laughs> i still don't know what it does i just do what other people are are doing and pretend that i know I don't I don't know what it does and it's too late to ask. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like all that I know is that if you want to keep your hand pick 0. But if you don't want to keep your hand I it's a lot of it's a lot of it's a lot of emotion for safe to to steal a, a colloquialism from some other reality TV show. But that, that's that's a lot. That's that's just like that's an energy that I'm just like mm, it's 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 tough for me to want to engage with that one. And if I were to cast it I'd kind of feel like all right. So here's my dissertation, yes. <laughs> and at the end of it, it's going to turn out that actually all that really happened is that one person lost their life and a couple of people got a new hand. But it's so many words to get there, and it's like, Ugh! And there are plenty of, like, complicated cards. I, I, I'm a big fan of Council's Judgment. It's a voting card, and whoever, whatever creatures are, or whatever permanents are, have the most votes or tied for the most votes are exiled. Um, and, and it always, whenever I play it, it almost always takes a second to explain it. But it's easy to explain. Everyone like pretty much immediately grasps what's going on, even though they don't know it. That's not really how Wheel of Misfortune works. <laughs> the people that don't know what it means oftentimes are really struggling to understand. You can't just briefly lay it out and have everyone just get it. Yeah, well, and Dana, so there's a card that it's easy to tell people what it does, but it's really hard to tell people what it means and how to actually carry out that. <laughs> so much, in fact, that when we played a game with Sheldon Mannery, who is the godfather of the Commander format, who's involved and like gets to look at cards before they're printed and give feedback, still doesn't know what this card does exactly. Uh, Sphinx of the Second Sun is six blue blue for a six six Sphinx with flying. And at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, you get an additional beginning phase after this phase. And you know that phenomenon when you say a word so many times you forget what it means? Oh, yeah. That's what this card does with phase. Phase. <laughs> and, and so yeah. I, when we played the game with Sheldon on stream, I think we executed it three different times, three different turns before he just sacrificed it to his own thing just to get it off the battlefield, <laughs> just so it doesn't slow everything down. And that was so stinking funny to me because this card just, you spend more time trying to figure out how to do the thing that it does more than you do actually doing the thing. This is one of those moments where you do appreciate, even though Animate Dead has 4 billion words on it, at least the concept is actually very, very simple. Yeah. It's just like, card creature from graveyard, go in minus one. If kill enchantment, creature, go away again. Like, all right, cool. But Sphinx of the Second One has fewer words and yet becomes a little bit more... Like, wait, when is this? Is this a triggered ability? Or if is it not? Like, if I have multiple Sphinxes of the Second Sun... Are, do I get multiple of these phases or does it not work that way? And also a thing that I constantly see people forgetting is that you don't get a main phase after this beginning phase. It is like a beginning phase and then it goes straight to the end step. And so like it's also just confusing mentally to be like, wait, how exactly is this supposed to fit in? And to be honest, I feel kind of similarly with Moraug as well. Moraug is the landfall. You get extra combats, but those extra combats can only happen if you play the lands during your second main phase. But after the battle phases that you get that are extra, you don't get an additional main phase after those. So like it turns every land into a relentless assault, but not really. And so each of those that add new phases and play with time in that way can be like, okay, wait, I need to recalibrate my brain in one second. Uh, what does my card do? Like, yeah. Yeah, Morag is definitely one that like every time I, I, I've seen it played, we have to do a pause because I know it's wonky. And if you read the card carefully, you can kind of pa parse it, but you have to reread it every time because it's, it's, it's terribly unintuitive. And Sphinx of the Second Son, even reading the card doesn't explain that. <laughs> like, like the way it's worded makes it also very challenging to figure out what it even does. 
Well, and you know what? I think a thing that complicates this or the, the thing that makes it harder for us to try and keep track of is the fact that there are those little differences, right? Like Morag does introduce new combats, but in a way that is slightly different from other new combat spells that we're already familiar with, like the Relentless Assaults, which does give you an additional main phase after those things. And I find that those tiny differences can sometimes be the thing that makes us a little bit fatigued with these types of cards. Like, for instance, there are plenty of cards out there that have what we would call blink effects, exiling a thing and then bringing it right back. But then we also have a thing that are flicker effects, which are different, question mark, because they bring the thing, they, they exile the thing and bring it back, but at the end step, and I don't know which one is supposed to be blink and which one is supposed to be flicker, but I know that there are certain cards where it's just like, hey, let's exile stuff and then bring it back, and then some of them are on the end step and some of them are not. Or with red's impulse draw, that's another one. There are a bunch of red impulse draw cards that you can exile cards off the top of your library, and until the end of this turn, you can play them, and then there are ones that are like, until the end of your next turn you can play them so keeping track of which one is which does actually kind of like start to tax your own brain and make it harder for you to keep track of which cards am i supposed to be able to play in these ways and i think that those little issues can also tally up in that way yeah that, that was always an issue too um and at this point i, I i've separated out what cards work that way but the, the red draw a card then discard you I mean the blues draw a card and discard a card versus reds discard a card and draw a card oh sure also tended to really throw me for a loop, particularly in my early days of, of seeing that, because the first couple of times I tended to see it on like blue, you know, Merfolk Looter-esque cards. And when I would sit on a red card, I would just default to wanting to to make the the draw before I discard portion, which is, I guess, technically, if you draw first and discard, it's looting. If you discard first and draw, it's rummaging. Um, <laughs> but yeah, same thing. Like it, it, that's a that's a super unintuitive one, I think, for players who are used to just easily to get in the habit of doing one, and then like it's not always the same thing. I think these memory issues also can like happen a little bit more directly with certain cards as well. So like you, you guys know that I have my commander commander deck where every card must say the word commander on it. And there's a background that I have in that deck that modifies my two commanders that I really, really like. And it's noble heritage. And I really, really like this card, except that I also sometimes really, really don't like this card. Um, it is the two mana white background commander creatures you own have when this creature enters the battlefield. And at the beginning of your upkeep, each player may put two plus one counters on a creature that control for each opponent who does you gain protection from that player until your next turn. So already that's a bit of a, an ask because protection is another one of those things where mentally I'm like, okay, I have to put together what does it mean? It can't be damaged, enchanted, blocked, targeted. Those are the, okay, yeah, I remember. All right, these are the things that protection does. But it's easy to forget what some of those abilities are for protection. But not only that, I sometimes forget who took the deal because maybe <laughs> someone played a board wipe and I'm like, wait, I don't remember which, which creatures got the counters on them. So legitimately a friend of mine Matt, I think you'll absolutely love this. A friend of mine has a Wilson and Noble Heritage uh, deck. It's a Noble Bear. And <laughs> he sort of took he took inspiration from Brazilian steakhouses where you have those little things <laughs> that have like red on one side and green on the other for like, yes, I would like to have more food or no, I would not like to have more food. And, oh, yeah. And, and he gives those out to everyone else so that he can remember who took my deal <laughs> and who didn't take my deal. Wonderful. And that's sort of a, his way of like mentally shortcutting it because otherwise turns can go so long that by the time it gets back around to some other person and they're like wait did i take your deal or not can i attack you i can't remember and so like those little <laughs> brazilian steakhouse flippy thingies help to keep track of that memory issue because this is a card that also is just like uh this is doing another mental tax on me that i wasn't ready for well and some of the backgrounds so so i love backgrounds probably one of my favorite twists on the partner mechanic maybe ever uh it's great mechanic absolutely fantastic mm. the only downside and i i will criticize this is is sometimes it's hard to keep track of like with Noble Heritage, uh, when this creature enters the battlefield and at the beginning of your upkeep. So it's it's very easy to think, okay, I got this out the one time, but you forget about the other times that the ability is going to happen. There's several backgrounds that have that. And so, yes, if, if I had to offer a criticism is it's giving commanders an ability that happens at two different points in time, and you have to remember both of them. That's where I'm kind of, ooh, okay, I forgot that one trigger whoops a daisy because i just in my head i thought okay well i got it that one time i'm good but then you forget the other time that it's supposed to happen yeah a, a lot of and usually like having those counters will be a nice easy way to track it but you know sometimes something happens to those creatures and you don't have the physical thing on the board anymore to help you remember so i don't know a brain hack will be very very helpful for that you know what speaking of counters though matt <laughs> You're a huge fan of the Nuka Pena precons, weren't you? Mm, so, so fan-tastic. <laughs> 
that's so that's a no uh no, I'm not. <laughs> this is my sarcasm voice um but i feel like one of those the it was the perry the pulverizer mm-hmm. <laughs> might be also one of those kind of fatiguing cards right because yes. that's the one that cares about how many different types of counters that you have yeah so when we were at the magic summit in salt lake city which was a great big event we had a super fun time which was happening again so make sure folks if you have a trip coming up in November, a uh, fantastic event, but we got to play pre-cons with other folks in, in a pod of just only pre-con decks. I got this deck and I cast the commander once and I lost interest and I just didn't recast my commander the rest of the game. That's how much I was like, oh, this is, this is a pain in the butt to keep track of. And I was so unimpressed at the end of the game, I just gave the deck to the winner because like, I don't want to touch this thing ever again. That's how much I loved Perry the Pulverizer, just everything that went into tracking what was going on with my own commander, much less three other players at the table. That's a shame too. I think that that's like an interesting idea to explore. And I think that the deck is like probably doing, I think the deck is like constructed as well as it could be, I guess, for that strategy, but it is a tall order. It is asking you to keep track of a lot of moving plates or or spinning plates or whatever the words are. See, my words are leaving. I don't remember, but there are a couple of commanders like that, right? Like an Obeka deck or a Mirasil deck. Like if you are going to play one of those, you are signing yourself up for a very clerical admin type of commander experience. Yeah. And particularly it's one of those things too, where um, you're signing yourself up for it. And then you have to also deal with like feeling in some cases you put that on somebody else. Not only am I keeping track of this, now they have to keep track of what I'm doing with these particular creatures as well. Um, so yeah, I, I don't love, I don't love my thing forcing us work on other people. And those, those tend to do that as well. Well, and, and so there's a fine line too, of being something relatively easy to track. And then something that just gets super complicated Mm -hmm. just by changing a couple words in the sentence. So Kyler's a guardian emissary is one of my favorite decks. It's a humans deck. And as Kyler gets bigger and gets different counters, all my other humans get bigger as well. But Kyla only cares about the total amount of counters on there. So you don't have to keep track of how many different counters. It can be plus one, plus one counters. It can be whatever, but it only cares about the total number. Whereas Perry cares about the different types. So it just gets that much more macro to the point where it's overly complicated. And just, it's, it's crazy to me how magic cards are able to walk this fine line of being clever and intricate versus over overcomplicated and uninteresting because of that. And there's something to be said for just like some of these strategies just being physically taxing as well. Yeah. Like yeah. sometimes not even necessarily mentally, but like I literally described on a previous episode how when I took a bunch of my fetch lands out of one of my four color decks, I started to play it more. Sure. Because I just, oh, I wasn't shuffling as much. Oh, oh, I, I oh, this feels better. Or like I've had cascade decks in the past. And you know what? I got a lot of value off those cascades. I really did. But flipping so often was like my arm is tired you know i was just like sometimes i'm i'm turning into dana i, I you know i need my cup of tea i need to go to bed early like i just some, <laughs> sometimes these guards are, are just like they're asking a whole lot from me and my frail old body can't handle all of these actions that i'm supposed to do i don't want to shuffle that much i just like i'll have more fun if i don't have to worry about all of that extra manual labor well and, and especially in like a deck that isn't dedicated to cascade like a dedicated cascade deck is usually built in a way where like you will cast get that 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 eight cascade and there's a bunch of things in there that you can hit at the that mana value because your deck's intentionally made to kind of cheat those things in play. When you just have something that does an occasional cascade and you're like, oh, I just cast this two mana value spell. Well, let's flip till I find either my soul ring or this, you know, one drop creature I happen to have. <laughs> um, so like, th- th- it's even worse, it feels like sometimes in the, in the non-dedicated cascade decks when you have something that does cascade. I feel the same way about Storm. <laughs> like, l- listen, the storm cards are really fun. A storm deck can be really, really interesting. It's fun to see those pop off every once in a while. But an Aetherflux Reservoir constantly gives, like, first you get one life, and then you get two life, and then you get three life. And you know what? Math is hard, okay? Like, sometimes I'm not able to do all that. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I said that earlier, Joey, is I, I don't want a mathless and I want a win condition. And, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, so right. so if, yeah. If, you, if, if we're talking about math twice in an episode, that's probably a sign that we should wrap it up because... <laughs> I, I really didn't like high school. I didn't take a math class since. I really don't want to take another one now. Talking about math twice in a show is four times as much math as I wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I All right. I, I, y- y'all have um, really multiplied your hum- – <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Uh, divide and con- – no. All right. I'm going to uh, – this is getting exponentially worse by the minute. Um, <laughs> it's, I, I feel like it's duplicative of the examples ergo – 
concordantly to filibuster. I th- those were all words. Uh-huh. I understood each of them individually. <laughs> they were. The, the, I thought we we really have lost at this point. What we're going to segue. What you're saying is that you don't like show. math or linguistics. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. And don't. My mom's an English teacher too, so she probably is a little <laughs> little upset with me right now. No, I, there's a lot of different ways that these can all manifest. There are things where you're just like, all right, the rules are complicated. So every time I play one of these, I know I'll have to explain it. There are cards where it's just like, here's a lot of extra, like physically, I'll have to do a whole lot of extra actions, like a bunch of extra dice or show, a lot of shuffling, stuff like that. And then there's also mentally, are these cards causing a mental tax on me that is distracting me from playing my best game? Sometimes we don't want to constantly pester people. Do you pay the one? Sometimes we do just want to say a, a clean draw five spell or something like that, which it's totally fair whether which side of that line that you fall on. And so these were just some of our examples. But listeners, we would love to hear, you know, if there are any finicky, uh, nuisancey type of cards out there, a little cumbersome. And are they worth it to you? And what would make a card not worth it to you to play despite how good that card can be? This is a, a very interesting topic to go into. And we hope that we've given you a bunch of examples to, to reconsider and to make sure that you are having your absolute best, most fun time. So with that, let's wrap it up and not do any more math which is weird because the word math is contained in your uh twitter bio so matt where can people find you online if they want to contact you <laughs> i don't i don't control the nicknames that i'm given but you can find me on the twitters at mathemus 55 that's m-a-t-h-i-m-u-s-5-5 and don't forget wednesday evenings we are streaming over at twitch.tv slash edh recast we have guests on every single week it's always a super fun time so make sure you tune in for all of that as well and dana how about you you can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. I'm writing articles for EDH Rec and Commander's Herald. And you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash EDHRECast. True, true. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz. And you can find the cast at EDH Recast on the onlines. And if you've got a question for us, you can also contact us at EDHRECast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post-production of the show. Thank you so much, Chase. You can find them online at Mana Curves. And listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Wreck your deck.